the third episode uh, and uh, discussion session on points of no return, India's migration crisis, reflections and solutions. This is the third one. Like I said, the first one uh, focused on, just to recap a little bit, the next 100 days uh, where we talked about relief and rehabilitation as a response to the migration crisis that we were seeing unfolding across the country. The second uh, session uh, where uh, we had a lot of experts, particularly from the nonprofit world who were working on ground, talked about building bridges. The big challenge of uh, building bridges, ensuring and rebuilding trust uh, with those who had to leave under obviously very precarious circumstances from mostly urban India into different parts of uh, the country. The third part today is focuses on uh, the rural economy and could there be a new rural economy blueprint which will in some ways rebalance some of the demand supply factors that led to the migration in the first place. And this is really a question. And uh, the, the focus on in all these discussions is to reflect and to provide solutions. So we have three guests uh, today who are going to talk about uh, these three, uh, the, the, the aspect of uh, migration and uh, the rural economy from their vantage point. So let me introduce you to them very quickly uh, in the order that they will be speaking. Dr. Ashok Gulati, who's the Infosys uh, Chair Professor at the Indian Council for Research on International Economic Relations. Uh, Dr. Gulati is a Padma Shri from 2015. He was uh, earlier part of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council. He's also been Chairman of the Commission for Agricultural Costs and Prices, Government of India, 2011 to 14. Around the time, I think, where he started his uh, very articulate columns in the Indian Express, which we continue to read and uh, almost devour today. Uh, our, our next guest is uh, Tarun Sauni, Vice Chairman and Managing Director of Triveni Engineering. Now, uh, Triveni is a, uh, one of the India's largest uh, sugar manufacturers. It has seven sugar mills in eight locations in Uttar Pradesh and uh, engages with over 250,000 farmers in cane marketing and development. So uh, a, a very close on-ground perspective, but from an industry point of view, Tarun also is a past president of the Indian Sugar Mills Association and sits on several committees on agriculture and sustainability. And uh, Rukmini Banerjee, uh, who is CEO of Pratham, now, uh, Pratham is uh, a nonprofit that is very well known, actually, for leading the annual status of education report, or ACER, as it's now better known as, which uh, used to survey about 600,000 rural children for over 10 years. Uh, uh, Pratham has also touched about 58 million children in uh, their literacy and vocational programs in 21 states. Uh, Rukmin is a Rhodes Scholar from uh, Oxford and also got a PhD from University of Chicago. And... Uh, and uh, I'm Govindra Jethiraj. I'm a journalist. I've been a financial journalist and now focusing on using data to tell stories and fighting misinformation. So thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, I urge you all to participate actively, leave your comments, uh, ask, uh, story, uh, ask questions, and or narrate stories for that matter. And uh, hopefully this will be an interactive uh, conversation. My, I've, I've already reminded my panelists that we are to treat this like a round table that we are sitting around. Uh, and not as a linear question and answer discussion. So please throw in your questions and comments and feel free. And each of our guests are going to speak for about five or six minutes from their vantage point on, uh, on this uh, theme, like I said, is about, uh, uh, is about reflections and solutions. So Dr. Uh, Gulati, uh, let me hand this over to you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be on your show here. Uh, what I'm wondering is how to reboot the rural economy uh, in the face of uh, when there is a massive uh, migration back to the villages, uh, these people have come from mega cities of Mumbai or Delhi or Ahmedabad and other places are not the ones who are totally unskilled. A larger part of them have some skills and they were not the poorest of the poor, you know, as we defined below. $1.9 uh, uh, per capita per day. Uh, they, they were somewhere above that and uh, they were living with dignity and with work and uh, earning their livelihoods. Now when they go back, uh, what are they going to do? There isn't much in agriculture. Already agriculture is saddled with, uh, I would say, uh, too much workforce. Uh, the latest data that has come last week is 42.5% of India's workforce uh, is engaged in agriculture. Uh, when agriculture is contributing only 16% or so to the overall GDP of the country. So agriculture cannot take more load of these people who are going back to the villages. What are the options? 
uh, in the first 100 days some relief work you know some cash uh, disbursements or uh, some support system even manrega could help but if half of them even don't go back to their jobs uh, they are going to stay here and we have to find some productive jobs for them uh, one basic idea that i want to put uh, before uh, the audience is uh, you know i'm reminded of the second world war and uh, a major construction plan in europe called the marshall plan that us wanted to reconstruct europe now the eastern india from where most of these people have come you know take uh, eastern up or bihar or jharkhand or the part of chatisgarh odisha and west bengal that's where the larger chunk of migrant labor uh, had been going to the south and to the west or even to the north uh, they are below all india average on all development indicators whether you take infrastructure housing the sanitation uh, education health all indicators of development and social sectors they are normally below the all india average so i would suggest and submit that the government should think of a mega plan maybe call it a modi plan or marshall plan or migrant uh, laborers plan or whatever you want to call it but uh, you know okay i think we've uh, lost uh, dr gulati for a moment we'll wait for 10 more seconds uh, if he doesn't come back uh, tarun may i hand over to you and then uh, we can come back to him later so sure. okay great so uh, tarun uh, why don't you take over and then uh, uh, we'll come back to dr gulati the moment we get him back sure govind uh, let me just start off by um... thanking uh, kiran pasweecha and the arantha aspen center for inviting me here today um it's a, it's a pleasure to talk about a subject that is very near uh, um and dear to me the revitalization of the rural economy of course dealing with the migrant crisis takes precedence it is front and center it's something that we're facing today uh one has seen it in my own industry in my own businesses we have encountered hundreds of thousands lakhs and lakhs and lakhs of of migrant workers uh we have in our own way been able to support people uh very frankly speaking the the timing across north india was was for um wheat harvesting and so there was ample opportunity and then of course for sugarcane sowing as well ample opportunity to absorb some portion of the migrant workforce into agriculture immediately because there was a paucity of labor and this filled in but it was a momentary respite it was certainly not for the uh, larger population that was actually migrating and those are problems that we have continuing today and i'm happy to share my my thoughts about it i mean this session is really about how do we drive jobs and enterprise into rural india and how do we manage aspirations i think that's that's a very vital point that we need to consider so you know it, it it comes back let me lead off from where um uh, ashok gulati was was speaking you know it, it it also comes back to the prime minister's vision of an atmanirbhar bharat and the concept is really on self reliance you know when we move towards um a, a urban model you know a rural urban model we have to look at self reliance and i'm not talking about um neruvian import substitution but i'm talking about a decentralized system and rural india and the opportunity in rural india abounds it abounds in the medium to long term the real problem is how do we tackle the challenges in the short term and in that there is sufficient opportunity for administrative and policy reforms especially that of our legal system now there have been recent announcements of liberalization in the agricultural sector and this is essential you know indian agriculture again leading off from the first speaker has you know been dominated by two acts the essential commodities act and the state level agricultural produce marketing committee act the apmc act they're draconian in every possible way they have prevented agricultural entrepreneurship 
they have given sweeping powers to government officials to perhaps even imprison hoarders, fix prices, confiscate stocks, etc. We need to move away from that. And the steps have started. We need to empower local decision making. That is absolutely vital. Um, we need to have a laissez-faire market and we need to embrace that rather than having more of a controlled and structured economy, we need to have more open access to open markets. We need to promote um, a national common market. I think that's, that's absolutely vital. And it's a complicated scenario given our federal structure. Uh, investment in agricultural supply chains and value chains is something that will automatically happen with the large number of people. However, that's a medium term scenario. How do you get to that? How do you allocate sufficient capital? How do you raise skills to be able to employ the, the, the lakhs and crores of millions of people that have been impacted by this migration? And in all of this, my belief, uh, I've been rather optimistic, is, is that the government's role is that of an enabler. It is to provide soft and hard infrastructure, including health, education, skill development, and to support industry in achieving all of these goals. But you know, in going back to a, a post-COVID era, you know, we have to think of the 70 to 100 million migrant workers that are landless. And how do they take advantage of the developments that have happened in India over the last 10 years and that will happen in the future? One point I'd like to, a statistic I'd like to throw out is that now 25% of rural income comes from non-agricultural work. That's a small statistic, but it is much better than what it was 10 years ago. It is a statistic that needs to change. If we are to embrace this urban infrastructure, urban economy, we need to change that um, quite significantly. Uh, yes, the easy, uh, easy way is yeah, we can absorb people into the agricultural value chain and supply chain by the creation of new opportunities, by the creation of new industries. We can also encourage corporate India to invest where the labor is. It's a very simple thing. It's happened the world over. People allocate capital to where resources exist. If human capital is available in rural India, the encouragement to actually go out and invest in rural India has never been greater, and it will certainly happen. Um, there was a mention of Manrega. Now, Manrega, frankly speaking, the the uh, getting the Manrega card just just to qualify is something. It's a it's a bit of an arduous task. So you know that process needs to be um, facilitated by um, the authorities very very quickly. Yesterday there was a bench of uh, Justices Ashok Bhushan, Sanjay Krishan Kaul, and um, uh, M.R. Shah, um, to the best of my knowledge, who gave a, a, an important um, judgment on how they would like the state governments to act upon this and embrace the migrant workforce and to allow the, mig the workforce that is still stuck in urban India to actually move back in a safe and secure manner. These are important initiatives. You need to have the administrative, the judicial arms of our, of our government work together in a cohesive manner. Now, the, the challenge ready, education of course has to happen. The provision of health is essential. The fact that um, the PM's vision is to give a home to every Indian, to have a toilet for every Indian, you know, they will give rise to huge amounts of construction opportunity. Um, and that along with agriculture will be the first two areas where you will see short-term opportunity. But the real thing that we need to see is reskilling. You have, who are the people that are going back? Okay, we've, at our, across Uttar Pradesh, you know, we have, we now have 11 locations. We deal with 170,000 people a day. And we've been in conversation with them because we're giving feedback to district and state governments in terms of what we're encountering on a day-to-day -day basis. And we're seeing a wide variety of people. We're not seeing necessarily unskilled laborers. We're seeing people who are Ola drivers. We're seeing gym instructors. We're seeing uh, people who were working in the textile industry. We're seeing people who were working in tourism. You know, they have certain skills. It's not as if the entire migrant workforce is a completely unskilled workforce. But it is about reskilling because the opportunity, you know, 
when you go back to your villages, the same people that are going back, the villages are very different. There has been some movement in infrastructure, gas, electricity, roads. There has been some development from when the, people, when the very same people moved to urban India. So they will find more opportunity. It's a younger population as well that is migrating back to rural India. So we've got to bear all of these very important points in mind in terms of, of finding a solution. 1% of our GDP is spent on skilling. We need to raise that to 5%. We need to get corporate India to use CSR funds and the NSDC to work together in, in terms of addressing the skilling. And that is really, that is how we're going to build faith in the system, which is something that we're finding um, all around right. uh, in this crisis today. Thanks. Right. Thank you uh, for that, uh, Tarun. So, uh, Dr. Gulati, we lost you when you were talking about the, the eastern, uh, you know, the, I mean, the, the flow of migrants from eastern India and uh, the, the average uh, level of income and prosperity. So, if you want to add something to that, uh, because when we lost you, and then we can uh, go on to Rukmini. You know, the main point is that uh, construction activity is the one that creates a lot of jobs and can absorb the skills. And the best thing is to go for housing for all in the eastern region, front load that, you already have that program, and go in a big way towards that. Along with agriculture infrastructure, if you can build, that will generate the demand for cement, steel, you know, logistics and uh, electrician and fitters and others. So that's the way that I would put uh, I think what Tarun had uh, indicated is building supply chains uh, in a business-oriented commodity-by-commodity manner, uh, which, is, which will flourish if the infrastructure is in place. So you can build the business if the infrastructure is right. Otherwise, building business is doubly more difficult. So that's what uh, I would suggest uh, as the starting point for the next two years, at least. Uh, you know. Right. Okay, create a massive demand surge in uh, Eastern India uh, and uh, use uh, construction as a driving force uh, within that. Uh, Rukmini Banerjee. Um, I, I like the thought of this uh, maha plan or a, a mega plan uh, that Professor Gulati has been talking about. And I don't know, <clears throat> Govind, if you selected the people on this panel, uh, making sure that Tarun is from UP and I actually belong to Bihar. So we are perhaps the right people uh, to be part of this conversation. So I want to just quickly uh, just uh, highlight that, you know, there were, we had some major problems even before the crisis happened. Uh, I recently heard uh, uh, Esther Duflo, one of the prize winners from the last year's Nobel Prize say that the old problems, by the way, haven't gone away. So don't forget about the old problems. We have now new challenges ahead. And so coming from the point of view of uh, Young people, I would say that, you know, well known, we have very high enrollment rates uh, across even Eastern India. Uh, for the first time in the last couple of years, anybody who started school uh, in first standard has actually managed to reach up to eighth. What this does is actually raise aspirations hugely for what lies ahead. And our aspirations are largely based on uh, kind of um, the path that you see other educated people have gone. And uh, we did, uh, as part of our ASSER survey, we, uh, in 2017, we took this age group, 14 to 18, and looked not just at you know, what they can do in terms of their basic ability to read or solve problems and so on, but also looked at their aspirations. And across the board, anybody who has reached that age and is still in school wants a white collar job. Now that in itself, most of these people are not going to go through a very successful higher education or even a secondary education. The skills that you'll get at the end of it are not particularly um, uh, at a high level, but your aspiration of yours and your family, and often these kids are the first to have reached up to eight and beyond, is huge. So I think we have to keep in mind that there is that kind of a... Uh, on the vocational skilling side, uh, <clears throat> You know, we are known more for education, but we have about 30, 40,000 young people who are getting uh, through our vocational programs, all from a rural background. And the, uh, the, the conversion rate, by, by the time you meet young people, talk to them about vocational skilling and how many actually show up at your center, is almost like four or five out of a hundred that you talk to. So already this idea 
idea of getting skilled in this way and then even though there is placement at the end of it we had very high placement rates two batches from a few but even that you know rural youth mobilization and i'm talking about uh, you know uh, the last couple of years we never sent them to big cities because for a young person starting out on a job alone in a big city uh, is intimidating and very expensive so a large part of our placement of uh, young people was in you know uh, the organized sector hospitality healthcare and so on but uh, not in delhi bombay or calcutta or chennai um, and interestingly a large part of our success in our vocational skilling was coming from an adivasi belt from chatisgarh from jharkhand from odisha unlike bihar bihar every bihari has an uncle in every city in india and therefore you can rely on uh, you know your kin networks to get you there and a uh, informal support structure in the city that can support you but if you are coming from chaibasa or simdega or uh, you know other uh, uh, tribal areas you don't have that connect and therefore you need a connect to go and come so this is where we were and i think that the mindset i think in human capital we focus a lot on skills and capability but there is an aspiration and angle and there is a where do you want to go to and after years of not having enough education everybody wants to go to a destination which actually didn't exist then and certainly doesn't exist now um and even our skill pathway i think was being built thinking that young people want to go through vocational skilling but most don't so where are we today if i look at the villages uh, you know that i know well uh, large numbers are coming back Uh, and as both of you have said tarun and ashok that uh, uh, these are not people you know who are completely unskilled they are coming back and their aspirations have been hit badly and so it's sort of you had a certain kind of life in the city you have come back and you know you're, you you left for a reason and that reason hasn't gone away uh, up particularly has almost 50% of rural children in private schools low cost local private schools those are going to get i think hit quite badly which means there will be a surge of Uh, enrollment back into government schools in a government school system which is already strapped and so really the challenge is yes there are a lot of medium and long term issues but immediately in the short run what can you do to productively use people who are there i was talking earlier to a, a, a colleague and a friend yamini ayer at the center for policy research who's done a lot of work on school finances and uh, we were working out and we we need a little bit more time before we can actually come up with numbers but if you had an annual maintenance contract of 15 schools in your cluster or across a few panchayats you could actually can you make a living out of that can this be a viable thing midday meals are cooked in every school in india usually they are cooked by you know women uh, it's not a particularly well paid uh, enterprise and you have to economize with uh, the grains that you get but it's a huge task that happens every day and it's never been looked upon as a way to build a skill in the same village when there is a neota there is a barat the people who are cooking are men and so you know can something be done on on the job things that you have to do anyway all schools have a uh, land uh, some land and many schools that land lies vacant is there a way that you could be a group of young people who say that i'm going to plant uh, vegetables in your uh, uh, piece of land uh, give a portion to the school and a portion for us i mean what are the ways immediately that we can use skills that people are bringing back provide opportunity uh, uh, right there um, there are a lot of education and you know livelihood surveys but you know for example what does a panchayat need how much construction normally happens there over a period of let's say a year how much is likely to come in i think there is going to be an increased need for planning mapping and assessing you know everybody is saying rural enterprise uh, you know Uh, young logon ko entrepreneurial skill sikha do but entrepreneur to do what how many and how many beauticians can you have or how many plumbers can you have in what kind of a uh, area so i think that very quickly even in the short run uh, some very quick uh, assessments of what can uh, you know a particular um, a region one panchayat five panchayats panchayats in bihar are quite big actually afford and how much money comes in through a variety of different schemes so i think along with the mega plan there needs to be a uh, maybe a you know panchayat level plan to say ki agle ek saal mein kya kya hone wala hai and to what extent can the people who've come back actually help in executing some of that uh, 
Uh, Narega only allows certain kind of activities. But in the COVID period, could Narega be opened up for actually allowing a wider range of kind of rebuilding activities that are, uh, you know, that may be required? Uh, if enrollment goes up in schools, rooms will be required. Those, those all have to be done by the PWD or can they be done by, you know, people who are in the village? I mean, there are, I think there are local ideas that have to be collectively organized to think about the resources that come in and how can they be better used. Okay, thank you very much. You know, so uh, I'm getting a sense that uh, all of you in some one way or the other are talking about uh, sort of uh, bringing in the solutions uh, at the rural end and finding uh, ways to occupy, uh, you know, through vocations and otherwise those who are returning. The previous discussion where we spoke to, uh, you know, uh, two nonprofits, uh, including Ajvika, who does a lot of work in migration, uh, uh, migrant labor, uh, and we also spoke to a Bombay-based uh, low-cost builder. Uh, he spoke about what he would do or his uh, firm would do to bring people back and the better conditions that he would now provide uh, that, uh, uh, you know, once this once people start coming back, because uh, he will need them, uh, as would most of the construction industry. So I don't know whether there is uh, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I think conflict is too hard a word, but uh, divergence in the, these points of view. So let me put, put that first to you, uh, Dr. Gulati. So how, are you, I, I mean, is this, is this going to work uh, and move seamlessly? Where is the, I mean, finally it's going to depend on where the demand uh, pressure is. And if uh, urban India is going to create that demand once again, because construction particularly, uh, which is the source of most of migrant labor is going to resume and uh, people will actively start, uh, you know, enticing people back, or maybe they won't even need the enticements. You know, th this uh, will have to be seen that how many people go back to Mumbai or to, uh, Ahmedabad and others, because to tell you very frankly, India has failed uh, in treating them uh, the way human dignity needs to be treated, whether it is the Right, okay. Uh, I think uh, we are uh, facing internet connectivity issues here. Okay, so we've got lots of questions uh, coming in as well, but I do urge you to uh, keep throwing in the questions. Rupini, let me come to you. So you've talked about uh, the focus on, uh, you know, the panchayat. I mean, this is the, the flip side of what the builder in uh, Bombay was telling me. They said, okay, create uh, the grand plan, uh, the maha plan that Dr. Gulati spoke about, uh, you know, build it up uh, and create capacity at the panchayat level. So any example or illustration that suggests to you that this is po possible and how it is possible? particularly for this surplus labor that we are now talking about. Uh, you're on mute, uh, Rukmini. You know, I don't know much beyond schools and Anganwadis, but I see that these institutions which exist need to be strengthened, need local partnership to strengthen them and not only, you know, money that comes in from the top. And what kind of an each of these places, the reason I gave these examples was each of these places, a large amount of food is cooked every day. The food can always be better. Somebody cooks it. Whoever is cooking in the morning can actually do some supplemental income. Otherwise, maintenance of school buildings is a real problem. These may be very small things, but I think it is a time at which, uh, you know, uh, and perhaps it's happened somewhere. I'm not sure. We are going to try some of this uh, midday meal uh, upskilling of women. Uh, and see what does it cost and how can it be done and what can they do if they have the skill. You know, winning back a contract from a Bharat, uh, uh, you know, caterer may be difficult, but I think that this, this kind of, uh, you know, how can you uh, enhance people right now while they're doing things. On the, on the children's front, uh, this aspirant, I've been very worried about this, you know, how the aspirations are from education is actually going to depress the fact that you know, very soon after a couple of uh, cohorts going through and people realize there's nothing at the end of 10th and nothing at the end of 12th along the lines of what you thought. So can this crisis right now be uh, used to actually expand not just learning for school, which is what our entire education system does for more education and more education, but expand it a little bit broader to uh, look at, uh, you know, what I would call learning for life. So for example, how much plumbing do you really need to know if you're in eighth or seventh to be able to make sure that your school uh, water and toilets function well? Uh, you know, I'm not a plumbing person, but you know, one can figure that out. What are the things that while you're young and while you're in school, 
right now, for example, every migrant, and I can talk about Bihar, for example, I was in a village in Sitamani. And in that village, at the time that I was there, uh, this is a, you know, sometime or a couple of months ago, there were people who had visited, in that village, there was the experience and the exposure of visited 20 states. And there was a discussion to say, Ki, yaha ki anganwadi itni kharab kyo hai? And people said, I've been in Manipur, it's not so bad there. I've been in Tamil Nadu, it's not so bad there. Now, all this experience that people are bringing back, even for the time being, how can it be used to improve what is right there? Uh, most people who are coming back have digital skills. Perhaps those who are uh, not left also have digital skills. But can we say that by Diwali, everybody which has returning migrants makes sure that in their entire village, people know at least, you know, efficient navigating using a smartphone for, you know, one, two, three, four, five things. I mean, I think these are all opportunities. They may not create livelihoods, but they may create these other things that migrants are bringing back that are of value to the people. Right. Uh, Dr. Gulati, I'll come to you in a moment. Uh, we lost you again, of course. Uh, uh, Tarun, you know, uh, can, I, can you kind of walk us through from a slightly more uh, macro view? What is what to you is looking like the demand supply of uh, quality uh, or skilled labor, particularly in the context that you're dealing with them? So if you're, let's say, engaging with 250,000 plus farmers, uh, what could the COVID crisis have created, either in terms of those who are already there uh, and or and or those who will now come and join them. And is that something that's uh, good for you? Or do you see this as an opportunity? And how do you see this playing out? So Gobin, that's an excellent question. I, I, I am naturally optimistic. So I think I'm gonna look at the brighter side of things. There's been enough talk about uh, the, the great negativity, which is absolutely true, uh, and the great pain and suffering that exists today. Um, the one thing I would like to say before I start answering your question is that it is, now incumbent upon every state government to ensure that all BPL families get access to food through the public distribution system. There has been never a, 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 a time in our nation's history where the PDS and the efficacy of the PDS has been more in question. So we will see. But yes, coming back to your question, I think there's, there's, there's tremendous this tremendous opportunity. I think that um, there are three or four things that I would suggest and advocate. The first point is perhaps a little more controversial. I think there are enough um, government run agencies, the railways, for example, innumerable NGOs that are working and assisting uh, my, the migrant workforce in terms of going back, leaving urban India or leaving uh, leaving states in South India and come back to the north and the northeast of our country. Now, the bulk of this workforce does have identification papers. Large quantums of people do. When they go back, they are carrying, I think the, you know, first, a large portion are skilled as well. We need to capture information on where, which district, which village, carries certain extra skills because the dissemination of that information will also bridge the gap between um, rural and urban India. It will allow corporates to actually go out and seek skills. It will also allow corporates and the government to work towards constructive reskilling in certain parts when you know what skills exist. Otherwise, if you're not able to capture this entire movement of of, of semi-skilled or unskilled workforce from urban India back to rural India, it's going to be a huge challenge. So I would suggest that we, we come up with some innovative schemes about data capture. It will serve us very well in, in, our, in our planning phase. The second thing that I would say is that there's a huge opportunity again for state governments to allocate common land to the migrant workforce. We have lakes, we have other portions of land that are under government control that are considered common land. Some of this common land has already, you already have squatters. Okay, that's, that's a reality. But there are large tracts of common land across. I know this for a certainty in Uttar Pradesh and in Bihar. Okay, uh, but I believe it exists across the country, Jharkhand, many other states. The opportunity to allocate those common lands through innovative models, again, is incumbent on the state government and will give rise to short-term opportunities in agriculture. 
The third thing I would say is what was very successful, and I was noticing over the last couple of years, is a lot of work that organizations like CII have done through their skilling initiatives, etc. The mobile training centers in Jharkhand, they were small initiatives over the last 24 months, but extremely effective in terms of providing skilling and reskilling capability to local communities. This needs to be broad based. Right. So those are the opportunities I'd like to uh, mention at this point. Right. Okay. So let me take in a few comments and questions. Uh, Balveer Arura says, uh, I think to your point, uh, the migrant labor was either exploited by contractors or abandoned by employers when they ran into rough weather. Do you think states from where they originate should play a more proactive role in securing stable employment contracts and benefits for them, ending their unorganized and informal character? Uh, another question and point to you, uh, Tarun, is distributed manufacturing, which is taking uh, manufacturing away from urban, semi urban areas to rural areas. To begin with, maybe ancillaries of a big manufacturing company as an anchor customer. Development uh, infrastructure and skill sets dedicated to a particular industry can be done by anchor customer out of CSR funds. Okay. Yeah. Say Maruti developing facilities for steel and iron casting in West Bengal. Surinder Makija. Uh, does this sound uh, sensible to you, Darren, uh, as a business person? I think I think both both points are are, are very reasonable. You okay. have to you have to now invest locally in decentralization, in decentralized manufacturing, because that opportunity certainly exists. There was a lot of talk about Indian manufacturing. Um, you know, let's let's say the the 90s and early 2000s, Indian manufacturing um, gained a lot of importance because people thought that there was a cost advantage. Then, over the last 10 years. We felt that this cost advantage was lost, uh, in, also in terms of the, the efficiency to our neighbors in Southeast Asia, et cetera. I think this gives rise to a huge opportunity. The, the, to the first point, you know, in preparation for this um, talk today, I was actually having a look at the laws of our country. And I didn't know that there was an act called the Migrant Worker, Workman Act of 1979 that existed. This and 13 other labor laws was subsumed by something called the Occupational Safety, Health, and Working Conditions Code of 2019. I want to mention that this code left out a very important section on migrant workmen. Now, I think that the first thing that needs to happen is that the sec this code needs to adopt a new section in the next session of parliament on right. migrant workmen. Because Safety and security is absolutely paramount. Right. Just a quick response, sir, since you're, uh, most of your uh, workforce and your operations are in UP. So uh, yeah, what's your reaction to the, the, new, uh, the, the new labor code, I mean, which is really bringing everything down to three, three codes for three years? So my, my, um, my reaction is it's, it's positive. I think any change to our very draconian labor laws are positive. As long as you ensure safety and security, and you ensure that there is dignity in the workplace, that's that's absolutely vital, and that's the kind okay. of role that the government has to play as an arbiter rather than an enforcer. Okay, I mean that's not the subject for today. So I, I, I would love to question you a little more. So, okay, question for Do Dr. Gulati: Why is there no focus on technology adoption at farm level to help improve yields, productivity, manifold, specifically for small and marginal farmers? that can both provide uh, significant jobs for tech-enabled build-outs as well as significantly improve. You know, technology, income. I would say, has penetrated uh, even in marketing. Even today, if you look at Bihar, wheat is being sold anywhere from 1700 to 1850 rupees per quintal, whereas the SP is uh, 1925 rupees a quintal. So the problem is if they don't get a good price for their produce, then they are not fully encouraged to go further in technology adoption. You know, to create a basic demand in the economy to reboot the system, I think there are two ways. One is a dole mechanism Manrega is largely a dole system. Cash transfer is largely a dole system. Now, this is good enough for uh, two months, three months, but we have to move from dole to a development model. We are lagging behind in development in this region, which creates development, but also creates income for these people, which will generate demand for the industrial goods. This is how industry will flourish. It's not a question of supply side. 
the larger problem we are in a recession because the demand has plummeted so we need to revive demand and how do we revive demand and the best way is a development model like the you know the great uh, recession in us uh, roosevelt came up with uh, a new deal at that time uh, to build massive uh, you know infrastructure for us i think the same thing we need to do for eastern india so the 20 lakh crore uh, program that the government has unveiled uh, steadily and uh, in in many phases is not an answer to any of this well i think i was talking to the chairman of nabard the first biggest thing is 1 lakh crore for agriculture infrastructure i think if you look at many of these programs some have been in existence some can be beefed up it takes a hell of a long time for the money to be released in the system uh, many of the earlier programs are lagging behind a small example i will give you uh, there is a program from top to total you know tomatoes onion and potatoes building value chains to all vegetables 500 crores were allocated back it was uh, arun jaitley who announced that program so far if you look at the website of uh, ministry of food processing which is uh, anchoring this uh, only 3 crores have been released out of 500 crores after 2 years so <laughs> so the question is if we have to do this massive job of the number of 11 point program that fm uh, uh, outlined for agriculture uh, package uh, we have to front load in a big way and i would go for major infrastructure build up and housing to start with i think this is right. where my hopes are as a part of the strategy for development Right. Okay. Uh, Rukmini, back to you. Uh, Rajendra Bahuguna says the major issue is the quality of education as there is little focus on learning. The ESSER uh, report or ESSER report itself brings up these disparities. If we use simple technology for classroom learning, the youth could be better qualified and productivity employable. Uh, productivity be, uh, productively employable. Uh, uh, any reaction on that? And then I'll come to the next question. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, one thing that this last couple of months has shown us is that uh, uh, one category of people who were totally left out of the education system, largely from, say, government schools, was parents. And at every level, starting from the elite all the way down to uh, the, a, a parent of a child in a primary school, uh, has, if possible, used technology in some way. We, uh, in Pratham, for example, have been sending out these SMS messages uh, to almost 11,000 villages. And we find, depending on what level the activity that you're sending out at. Uh, we get a lot of response from parents. So we've learned that parents can play a role. It's very different from when you are in a city and you know your child is attending a Zoom class versus you get 167 character and you're able to actually respond. But our tracking studies are showing that parents, once they feel that this message is for them and for their kids, and at that level, it can work. So I do think that governments also have been trying a whole bunch of things. Obviously, these last two right. months, people have been scrambling to do what they can. But coming out of that, there needs to be a digital layer, whether it is through basic phones, whether it is radio, that actually assists parents who are often not very educated themselves to be able to help their children. So I don't think, you know, e-learning is a very big word and online education is all big words. But I think that there are examples from what governments have done and others have done in smaller bits during this period that has proven to be surprisingly promising. And we must build on those. Right, so digital skills for parents, and this is a good time to uh, emphasize on that. Okay, uh, uh, back to you, Dr. Gulati. So a uh, question from Rahul Banerjee. He says, it is some states which produce more agriculture production and depend on migrant laborers like Punjab. But if we see most of the 80 districts where migrants have returned uh, from cities are in UP, Bihar, Bengal, et cetera, to your point earlier, so do you think overburdened agricultural workforce in these states can accommodate some of them at least? or half of 1.6 crores? Uh, going back uh, to UP and working in agriculture, or going back to Bihar and working in agriculture, they are already uh, overstaffed in agriculture. As I said, you know, we should be at present about 30% of workforce maximum should be working in agriculture. We are 42.5% of our workforce there. So we need to pull out but not push, you know, the thing is a pull and push factor 
you need to pull them out to other sectors to higher productivity, higher income. And that depends upon what your skills and what the demand of the rest of the economy is, right? This has happened all the world over. Problem is in Bihar, UP, the holding size is so small. And if they're, you know, less than one hectare, I mean, normally it's 0 0.6, 0 0.7 hectare. Now, if they have to support a family of five or six people, it's impossible that land cannot give you that unless you're growing grapes or lychee or something very high value with higher risk and higher capital that is needed. So I don't think there is much scope for agriculture to absorb, but building agriculture value chains into the system and linking urban India with rural India. Uh, you know, if you look 10 years ahead, 600 million people are likely to be in urban areas and they need to be fed and we don't have proper supply lines uh, built. So this is where much employment can be generated, building commodity by commodity value chains and supply lines uh, into the game. It requires physical infrastructure, it requires logistics, it requires uh, different type of entrepreneurship, which revolves around uh, post-harvest technologies into the marketing and uh, processing, food processing side, rather than agriculture per se, the traditional one. Right. And, and as you pointed out uh, in our conversation uh, just yesterday, that if they do work in agriculture or come back, the household farm income will only drop further. That's and, right. Right. So, uh, okay. So, uh, a couple more points. Uh, you know, the, this I think is aimed at... Uh, uh, yeah. I, so, the, let me read the question. I think in, in Maharashtra, there is a class of workers who move from place to place to cut sugar. And uh, I think the question is... Uh, Okay, I think I've lost the question. Yeah, but essentially uh, the question is, uh, how do these, how are these, can these people be better comp uh, compensated or managed, Tarun? Uh, may, this may not apply to you, uh, but maybe it would be useful for you to tell us, uh, how do you deal with uh, the farmers that you engage with for uh, cane marketing and development? Sure. You know, I think uh, um, when, you, when you're faced with a crisis like, like, uh, like the COVID pandemic, uh, there's all sorts of innovation that happens. You know, there are there are points in history uh, which have always come up with the best and greatest ideas, and they've come out of crises or points in pain. Um, in our very very small way, it took us a total of 72 hours to go completely touchless. We contact 1,70,000 people a day, and a lot of them change from day to day. And in 72 hours, we were able to go completely touchless. So we were able to ensure safety and security of everybody in our supply chain and in our value chain. And this happened through very quick technological development, through using mobile phones, which every single farmer of ours has, every single farmer. Okay, now you, and we stretch all the way from Muzaffarnagar to Gorakhpur. So we're covering the breadth of, of uh, the state of Uttar Pradesh. And very honestly speaking, that is why the control and the, uh, the participation of my firm in terms of ensuring that the spread of COVID was prevented through contract, through regular business transactions, that's how it played out. Many other firms followed suit as well. Now, in this leap for embracing technology, it was the state government which had to play a role in terms of giving permissions and authorizations. We still have all of these laws that prevent us from looking and harnessing modern technology and looking forward in terms of enhancing development. My particular what's view... A, I, what's an example finish. of... Uh, yeah, sorry. What's an example of... You know, you mentioned draconian law several times. So what's, give us one illustration, you know, one law that you would see, uh, you would like to see gone uh, immediately if, if that was possible. So I, I would like a complete reform of the APMC Act. Okay. Um, it, it's been on the cards for a long time. It is deeply political. And I understand exactly why it's not done, including and the, and the Essential Commodities Act as well. They were placed at a time when food security in India was absolutely paramount. Today, we have lakhs and lakhs of quintals of food grain that rots in government go-downs. Um, we have poor supply chains and value chains that don't allow fresh produce um, 
to, to arrive at marketplaces and to be purchased by consumers. And there's a lot of wastage across the system. This is well documented. And I won't, I won't throw data out at you, but there's, there's ample um, sure. talk about this. Now, the fact of the matter is the moment we actually try and, and look at this from a, you know, a 2020 perspective and the next 10 years in terms of mobilizing supply chains and connect and, and looking at connectivity between rural and urban India, we will need to change all of these goals because they create hindrances rather than promote capitalism. And that is what will employ a large number of the people that have been actually forcefully made to move back from urban India to rural India. Right. So uh, we've got 10 minutes more and uh, uh, we, I'm going to come to you soon, uh, very soon for uh, some ups. Now, uh, Dr. Gulati, a couple of questions. Uh, do you think uh, without the state's goodwill, contract farming can make uh, benefits for farmers? Uh, he, uh, this is Charu Jishnu. Uh, she or he says that uh, farmers doing contract farming uh, from West Bengal under PepsiCo have received 890 rupees per quintal, which is less than the traditional variety. As West Bengal, we have not implemented the Model Contract Farming Act and uh, the win-win framework failed. Gurdeep Singh says, uh, with the relaxation of the draconian provisions of the APMC, farmers can bypass the, uh, 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 I think he means Mandi, directly to Mandi food processors system. in food parks set up in rural India and deal directly with uh, food processing organizations, uh, in turn with food processors and food parks, sorry, uh, set up in rural India. Can this not uh, lead to large employment in processing while reducing uh, wastage through spoilage of fruit and vegetables? You know, the government of India came up with the ordinances, three ordinances on June 5th. Uh, one is uh, trying to liberate the Essential Commodities Act. Uh, the other two relate to APMC and uh, they haven't called contract farming, but broadly uh, uh, allowing contract farming. Uh, these are the three laws. Now, I think the movement is in the right direction except perhaps one caveat in Essential Commodities Act, uh, there is a clause they have kept. If there is an extraordinary price rise, then the stocking limits can be reimposed. Now, this little clause has the potential to undo all the reforms in the agriculture marketing system. Uh, most of the other things uh, I'm reasonably comfort comfortable with, you know, since the 2003 Model Act, of, uh, you know, during Vajpayee period on the agriculture marketing reforms, we have not succeeded. And that is because it was a state subject and so on and so forth. Now when the center has taken it up and brought out uh, ordinances uh, to create multiple channels for the farmers to sell to different people, Mandi system is there. If they want to go back to the Mandi system, they can keep doing but also open up other channels. Now that has the potential to give him a better deal, building better infrastructure. People can come build their own commodity value chains and it is between the farmer and the buyer how the things will unfold. I look it at more like what happened in the milk revolution, uh, you know, where uh, farmer producer organizations at that time, the milk cooperative societies were made. Uh, in today's world, the FPOs will be, uh, you know, uh, coming up in different states and major buyers will be buying from the FPOs and investing in the basic infrastructure. So that will create a lot of employment into that uh, whole system. Right. And Right. So right. quick, can I add to that very quickly for a shorter answer because we are now running out of time. Uh, Dr. Gulati, shouldn't we create, la uh, DK Agarwal asks, uh, shouldn't we create large labor intensive special economic zones in these areas where agribusinesses can be provided with best of facilities, inputs, and consistent labor laws? You know, the question of labor intensive, there are vegetable production is a labor intensive thing. But you have to be competitive also because you have to find out the market. Now, if after filling up your stomach, you have surpluses, then you should be able to export outside. And that's what requires building proper value chains and supply lines have to be put in place. So I think just looking at uh, you know, labor intensive or cotton industry, whole from growing cotton to garments can be a very labor intensive thing, but we haven't built up that thing and Bangladesh and Vietnam have taken better advantage than we have taken. You know, we 
became the largest producer of uh, cotton in the world and we were the second largest exporter of cotton in the world but we did not uh, work out on the garment side and the fabric side and the yarn side so it's the competitiveness and then inclusiveness both have to go hand in hand together if we want to do something good for the country okay right so uh, let me get a few sum ups now we've uh, got 5 minutes more so uh, you know one of the points that, uh, i mean we we've, we've looked at the let's say the demand supply but i think uh, one aspect that uh, we've not touched upon so much is the point that rukmini raised about aspirations you know that uh, every every child uh, who they've talked to and obviously they've talked to the most in this country uh, wants a white collar college job and this is something we know as well it's it's only perhaps a, a hard uh, sample or a survey that's uh, supplementing it how does all of this uh, square with aspirations and uh, how does this uh, i mean obviously aspirations are going to uh, slow down or uh, decelerate thanks to covid but but it's not like they will go away so how does all of this square and what would be your uh, you know as we as we've done with the reflections your solutions in a context of meeting people's aspirations uh, creating better incomes for them and obviously giving them a safe and uh, secure livelihood whether it's in urban india or in rural india but rural india in this case so uh, do you want to go first tarun um sure um, <laughs> you know i think managing aspirations uh, it's a very long question but i'm just going to focus on the first portion which is the management of aspirations i think it it, it falls completely in line with what i was saying building a sy- system of social trust and there has to be and this is we have to look at quick wins we have to look at all the low hanging fruit that is available today and there isn't very much because we're still battling that crisis uh and therefore at this point in time it's about providing safety and security to the migrant workforce the moment we this crisis abates the virus abates we then have to look at opportunity and i'm just going to throw out two sunrise industries i believe um uh, exist emanating from this crisis the first is bioenergy as far as rural india is concerned the spectrum of bioenergy is so vast and can employ so many lakhs of people that that is a sector provided we have uh, some amount of um, stimulus etc in, in terms of demand uh, that is created that is a sector that can do extremely well employ a lot of people the second something that uh, i have uh talked about quite a lot in my discussions with organizations like niti aayog uh, etc is is a concept of smart agriculture you know we we've talked about uh, when we talk about agriculture we always talk about the denominator okay burgeoning population that's involved etc etc we really need to look at the numerator we need to look at technologies we need to look at opportunities that allow that numerator uh, of productivity to increase and therein lies a great scope as we have more skilled people that move back to urban india a younger workforce we will find creativity and thanks. employability in that thanks okay uh, rupini over to you yeah a very a couple of things one is uh, uh, you know we've known from before that we have some very basic problems with sort of foundational learning uh, the government and their long list of uh, atmanirbhar bharat has announced a national mission for literacy and numeracy uh, foundation for literacy and numeracy fantastic thing i think this is something that we've been wanting to do and let's use uh, this opportunity from covid uh, to do so there are a lot of educated people who've come back to the village and therefore can 2020 be the year that you're able to use the excess skilled people in the village who have the basic literacy and numeracy to be able to work with kids who are coming back to school after a big gap so you know whether you do it out of uh, you know your community feeling or whether narega can be tweaked to say can 2020 be the year in which we make a major dent in one of major india's problems two other quick things uh, the returning migrants also uh, provide uh, possible role models yes they've come back now but the reason that every child in rural india wants to be a teacher or a doctor or a forge mein jana hai because that's who you see around so can we pick can schools pick for every day of the week after they open to have someone come and talk to the children about what is possible what opportunities lie out there and finally i think that if we agree that there is going to be need in the future not jobs that people are going to give you 
but things that you're going to have to do together, then we need to start in school of kids doing things in groups, potentially kids doing things that can be of benefit to the community. We've had some very good examples of this in our Kasturba Gandhi Balika Vidyalas, which are the residential schools, to say, identify a problem as a group of five kids, identify a problem that the village has and figure out a way to solve it. Incredibly creative things are coming out from kids who are in seventh and eighth. But you need to inculcate this uh, mindset early to say that I can solve problems, I can do things as well. Right. Okay. Thank you, uh, Rukmini. Uh, Dr. Gulati, last word. Well, aspirational uh, India and aspirational uh, rural India, I would say. Uh, a good thing is that uh, you have the labor, uh, you have young labor, and they are going to eat more, they are demanding more. Uh, they are looking for more action in terms of higher productivity. And this is where creating, uh, you know, 75% of India's uh, infrastructure is yet to be constructed. If you look at 2030, every year we have to create one new Chicago. So this is a massive potential to absorb all these skills. At present, these skills are very much informal. You can certify, you can grade them and map them and where they are. But I think my last point is that think big to create demand in a development mode and focusing on Eastern India, that's the way to go and create uh, good for the country and uh, regional inequality also will be tackled through that. Right. Uh, thank you all very much uh, uh, for your points. Like I said, this is the third of uh, uh, of the uh, of uh, third session of uh, uh, a folk. I mean, the, uh, of the migration series. We called it "Points of No Return: India's Migration Crisis, Reflections, and Solutions." Uh, the first two parts talked about the first hundred days, and the second part talked about building bridges. And the third one, as you can see, throws up the interesting demand opportunities and the demand pressure that we can create. The the good news from this this is that even as we saw from the second episode. Uh, uh, the people uh, in uh, urban, uh, urban India, the, the demand creators or the traditional demand creators will now uh, improve their act. Uh, uh, we can now see equally if there is sufficient spending in, in, the, in the grand East India investment plan or whichever, whatever way you want to call it, if there's sufficient pressure, the opportunities uh, and the choice for the migrants, uh, in, at least in theory, uh, will be lots. And, and uh, given our continued education focus, we'll obviously we are talking about uh, uh, educated, uh, skilled, and reskilled uh, people with the right digital skills, uh, not just amongst children, but also amongst older people uh, taking a great step uh, uh, forward in, in this post-COVID world. And uh, that's a good note to end on. Thank you very much, everyone, for your questions, for your participation, and uh, staying through. Thank you, and uh, see you soon. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you.